I'm a big fan of sometimes ignoring advice from others. <laughs> Throughout my career, I've often been like ignoring advice and I think it was often good because sometimes you just know what you want to do, but everyone tells you otherwise. And, but sometimes it's good to be stubborn. For me, it was writing the book. I have four books at the moment. So then I wrote also Interpreting Machine Learning Models with Sharp and also writing another book, uh, which is about supervised machine learning and science. Sharp uh, uses a very different idea. And the idea is that all the features are kind of players in a game and they work together to achieve the prediction. Now the goal is to take this prediction or the value of the prediction and assign it fairly to the players. The idea comes from, or the solution for this comes from game theory, because there's lots of research about how you could, if you have a team and they collaborate and they get some prize, how do you fairly uh, attribute them to the players? This episode is brought to you by Training Data. If you're new in data science and want to get into the field, or if you're already in the field but want to progress, well, Training Data is the platform for you. They offer courses on feature engineering and selection, model tuning, interpretability, and much more. You will get both the math and the intuition behind each method, but also Python code ready to power your own projects. So if you're interested, visit the link in the description and don't forget to use the code AI Stories to get a 10% discount. All right, so hello everyone and welcome to the AI Stories podcast. I'm Neil Leiser, I'm a senior data scientist and I will be your host. So today our guest is Christoph Molnar. Christoph actually studied statistics but then learned the machine learning bit on his own and after that, he did a PhD in interpretable machine learning at LMU in Munich. Over the past five years, he wrote a few books, including one that he is very famous for, Interpretable Machine Learning, and we're going to dive into it in this conversation. I actually read the book, learned a lot from it, so strongly, strongly recommend it. Um, but we are also going to dive into some of the chapters in this conversation. If you enjoyed the episodes, please subscribe to the AI Stories YouTube channel, comment, share, and leave a five-star review. All right, let's start now. Well, Christoph, let's start with the beginning. Just keen to understand how you actually got into this world of data science and AI. How did you get into the field? Yeah, thanks for the nice introduction, Neil. Um, yeah, so my like reason why I got into the field is kind of because I didn't want to make a decision what to do later on in my life. <laughs> um, so I liked maths a lot and I didn't know what to study. I actually tried like one or two things to, um, to study. And then I was like, ah, no, it's not the right things. It was like electrical engineering. And later then I saw that there's statistics that you can study statistics in, in Munich. And then I started st studying statistics because uh, for me it meant, hey, there's it's about data and there's data everywhere. So I don't have to decide which industry to work in. So for me, it was like, ha, so everything is open and um, I kind of have a key with which I can enter many fields. This was like my own main motivation to, to study statistics and get later on into the field of data science and also same motivation to learn machine learning. Okay, so because you knew it would open a lot of opportunities, and so you decided let's let's go for it. Yeah, exactly. So um, and since then, I, I never regretted the decision because uh, every time you get to work with new data, you always have to dive into the new data. So um, if you work with medical data, you have to understand the medical problem to some degree. You get to talk to doctors, for example. And um, then you might work with some very different data, maybe you do a Kaggle challenge or so. And again, you dive into this whole new field and you have this um, chance to learn a lot, but always like from this uh, position of tools that you already have with mm -hmm. like your mathematical tools. Um, so it's kind of like a key to, to many fields. And I, I think that's a great part about data science. So in which year did you study statistics and then can you dive a bit into how you got into machine learning and how how and why did you start learning it on your own? 
Yeah, so I studied statistics for five years. So I started in 2009. So I did a bachelor's and directly after that, a master's degree in, in statistics. So the whole process like five years. And at the end of the master's, you, we had some uh, possibility to pick topics. And there was like one, just one class for machine learning. And I was so much looking forward to this because I already heard about it. And I mean, this was like in 2011. So it was mm -hmm. just beginning to be, become more pop popular. And yeah, I was not so satisfied by this class because I think it wasn't taught well. Um, so what I did was then to study uh, uh, machine learning on my own. Uh, basically, I uh, took the uh, elements of statistical learning book and like read it from like beginning to end, which isn't, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> but at this point, um, well, well, I would recommend the book, but like it's tough to read like end to end mm -hmm. because it's like lots of uh, it's very uh, algorithm based and like one after the other. Um, but yeah, this was like how I got into to know more about machine learning. And I also did the Kaggle competitions at the time. So actually, I started with my very statistical mindset. And I trained like a linear regression model and generalized additive model and s thought about like which features or variables to use. And then when I uploaded it to the leaderboard, I was super disappointed because I <laughs> it was super bad. And But I didn't know all these things that you need in machine learning, like how to have a proper validation set up and the, the whole spectrum of nonlinear algorithms to use. So all these things were still not or rather new to me. So this was also motivation to get more into the field, like, hey, if I want to do good predictions, I have to learn all these other algorithms and, and how to how to use them well. Okay, so you, you study statistics, you then want to get into machine learning, you read this book of elements of statistical learning, which is quite theoretical. And yeah. then and then you, you do some practice with, with Kaggle. And at some point you then decide to do a PhD in interpretable machine learning. So before we dive into this, can you just explain what's, what is interpretable machine learning? What does it mean? Yeah, if you ask different people, they will tell you slightly different uh, definitions of this. But I would say interpretability is about making the predictions or the decisions of a model understandable. Now, there are different approaches how to do this, um, but this is the most general um, idea of interpretable machine learning, that you either design your models in such a way that they you can extract knowledge from them or that you use methods that can be applied to any model and try to, like after training the model, extract some insights. That that's, It's a very broad word and it mm -hmm. doesn't have like a super tight uh, from like um, definition. Um, so I, I, I see it as a keyword under or an mm -hmm. umbrella term under which you find a lot of approaches. And why do you think, I mean, I assume you think it's important since you did a PhD, you wrote a book on it. So why do you think that interpretable machine learning is important? Why do we need to understand the decisions of our models? Yeah, so interpretability is not a self-serving goal. It's not like, I don't know, performance, where it's mm -hmm. obviously that if it's performing, it's good. Mm -hmm. um, with interpretability, you do have to, first of all, decide why you need interpretability, because there's different reasons. And depending on the reason why you need interpretability, you also should follow different approaches. So I'm currently, again, uh, in doing a machine learning competition. And in this competition, I'm using, for example, interpretability to debug my model and improve it. For example, I uh, look at um, feature importance to get like a rough understanding of what the most important features were to my model. So I could focus on, the, on them more. Or so, at one point I had like target leakage. So the model was like really, really good and was a bit excited, but the mm -hmm. voice in my head was saying, no, 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 this can't be right. And when I looked into the feature importance, I saw one of the features was way up there and I actually had some target leakage because of a bug. And um, But you can also use it well, to improve the model, to debug the model. And in this challenge, for example, there's also a communication explainability part where there's another, a different goal of like interpretation. 
And this one is about like um, checking whether the model kind of coheres to the physics. So it's a hydrology challenge. Okay. So, um, and also to communicate the results, which again has a different, is a different goal than for when I debug and improve my model. And that's, um, yeah, also other reasons, like if you do a formal audit um, or if you use it in science to generate new insights or explore where you actually don't care about the model, but you want to study more the data that you have. Yeah, I, I also see this as, I mean, as you mentioned, it's a way to better understand your model. And so if you better understand your model, you can also be more certain that what it's doing is actually what you want it to do. Um, you can have a model that performs really well on a certain metric, but it could be because of a leakage, for example, as you mentioned, or because of other reasons. And so if you've got a black box model, like, I don't know, an XG boost or a deep learning model, and you don't fully understand it, well, sometimes it's going to be good. And sometimes it's also not going to be doing what you want, but you're not going to notice if you don't really try to yeah. understand how, how it thinks or how it makes decisions. Yeah, exactly. So for for lots of these debugging use cases, there there are also always other tools where, where, how you could do mm -hmm. achieve this, but they're way more complicated, I think, than just looking at the feature portents chart, for example. And of course, you could try like um, to remove features and see how the model performs and so on. Um, but the feature portents is like a quick way, for example, how you just get a rough idea of how the features are used um, or how they rank and yeah, to see things like target leakage, uh, get an idea which features to approve, improve mm -hmm. upon. It's because also important features are a good hint that that you should maybe think about how you could collect better data for them, or maybe there's a way to do feature engineering to use them better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also to sell a bit more interpretable machine learning. I mean, I'm a big fan of this field. I think it's super important. There are also, um, well, industries where you actually need to have an interpretable model. Like, for example, I was to I used to work a couple of months ago um, at a fintech where we're making mm -hmm. loans, and you can't just have a deep learning model that decides to who we're going to lend or yeah. and who we're not going to lend. Um, you can't just have a black box deciding this. So you really need to to understand your model. And so in some industries or in healthcare, for example, um, it's going to make decisions, important decisions. And you cannot always have a black box that will decide which um, pills people need to take. So, so that's why it's so important. There are some industries where if you don't have an interpretable model, you just cannot use machine learning. Yeah, exactly. So this, this what you mentioned is uh, more like the regulatory reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for this scenario, for example, uh, it might make more sense to to use models that are interpretable by design, like mm -hmm. good old linear models and maybe decision lists and so on, depending, of course, on the industry. And But there's all often just this human component that you have a boss who says, no, no, let's not use this complex model. I want to have some kind of control over the model to, I don't know, look at the coefficients or get like the basic reasoning behind what how the model made predictions. So there's this trust factor and yeah, sometimes one person in the company is enough to, to make all the data scientists uh, mm -hmm. needing interpretability. And, and so, so you mentioned briefly, one way is to use simple models like regressions, for example, which are quite interpretable. You you look at the weights and you can quickly get a feel of how the model performs. Um, if you want to use a black box model, then how do you make them interpretable? What are the different techniques or maybe family of techniques before yeah. we dive into them? Um, what can we do to make black box model interpretable? Yeah, as you mentioned, there are these two big approaches. One is designing a model that is interpretable, which is usually about uh, constraining the structure of the model so that the relationship that it learns are simple enough to understand, which can also differ by audience, of course. The other way is to do this after the model was trained. And these are so-called post-hoc post explanation methods or interpretation methods, 
which we again can divide into two parts. One is these model specific ones, which are only work for some type of model. Mm -hmm. Here's an example, uh, gradient based methods. So methods that make use of the gradient of the model to make the model more understandable. So which obviously only works for models that have a gradient and not for random forests, for example. And then there's this huge class of model agnostic methods, and um, I'm a big fan of it, uh, of them, and also uh, studied them in, during my PhD. And these, I think these are very interesting because they treat the model as a black box. So as a, just a machine that has some input and some output, and you're not allowed to look inside and you're not interested to look inside, but you describe the model by how it behaves when you change the input. And uh, it sounds, I think quite simple or maybe it's like how, how should you get any information then out of it, but there's a surprising amount of things that you can do with this approach. So you can use it to, so these model agnostic uh, techniques, you can use them to rank the features like there's different model agnostic feature importance measures. There's methods that can tell you how changing a feature changes on average the prediction. So these are called feature effect methods. And then there's a lot of methods that try to explain individual predictions. Um, and the, yeah, again, with very different motivations, things like Lime, which tries to fit a interpretable model around like the small area that mm -hmm. we want to explain and Shapley values, which is inspired by game theory and a bit more complex uh, method. Okay. Yeah. I'm interested to dive, to dive a bit into those. So. The, the model agnostic approach are basically approaches which work with any models, um, any mm -hmm. any machine learning models. You train your model, and after you've trained your model, you use those techniques to understand how it behaves. Correct? Yeah, exactly. That's also the yeah the good part about it, or the, the big mm -hmm. advantage that it's independent of the model in that sense. So you could also like implement uh, this part to like, and switch it out later on. Uh, also, I think this matches very well how you would usually approach machine learning that if, let's say, a year la so you deploy a machine learning model, you have this uh, explainability layer on top, and later you found out, hey, there's a better model architecture, and you swap out the architecture. And if you would use model-specific methods, or maybe an interpretable model by design, then you might also switch out automatically then how this model has to be interpreted. But if you use model agnostic interpretation methods, they they are this extra layer on top, so you don't have to switch it out, but you can compute it as well for the new model. Um, the big disadvantage I would say about these model agnostic methods is that they don't look inside. So mm -hmm. they just describe how the model behaves, but it doesn't tell you how it works inside. And that's, that's the nice thing about uh, interpretability by design, where you actually know that your model is a linear model, for example, mm -hmm. and really works by like as a weighted sum. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have a postdoc method that also like shows you something as a weighted sum, then it's maybe just an approximation to your original model. Okay. So you kind of summarize mm -hmm. information and yeah. Okay. And so, and so within those model agnostic approaches, you describe two things. One are techniques which look at the how the model behaves on average, right? Or over the, the yeah. entire data set, and then how the model behaves locally on specific instances of your data. So let's start with the first one, um, model global model agnostic approaches, which is how you, I think you define it in your in your mm -hmm. book. What are the different techniques that are there or the ones that you like? We don't need to mention all of them, but maybe one or yeah. two that, that you like um, and dive into it. Yeah, so as you said, there's global and there's local, and there's also some space in between, um, but that's, I think, a useful useful categories to know. And global uh, global model or global interpretation methods in general try to describe how the model be behaves uh, overall. So that's always uh, with respect to a data distribution. So, and there you can decide or distinguish between uh, feature importance and feature effects. So these are two big categories in global interpretation methods. Feature effects 
give a ranking and uh, sorry feature importance give you mm -hmm. a ranking of the features how important they were for the prediction and there you also have different choices um you can either do this based on performance or based on kind of variance how much the prediction changes and i already mentioned in the beginning of of uh, um, of this interview that uh, the permutation feature importance is one of the also i think it's quite famous technique mm -hmm. for feature importance and that's also one that i use very often and this one is based on a performance um so and it works in a quite simple way it's about when you um you first measure how well your model performs then you take one of the features shuffle it at least in the simplest version of this method mm -hmm. and then you measure then you get the predictions again measure again how well your model performs on average and that gives you the importance of that feature and when you do that for all features then you get a ranking of the features and get an impression of how how important they were for your models to make predictions so i think this is a that's one that you can always super easily implement yourself um and yeah, I think it's a super useful method. Um, there's also other importance methods that rank these by the features, not by how much they change the performance, but by how much the prediction changes. And ideally, of course, these would be very uh, overlapping, mm -hmm. but you can imagine a case where you have a model that overfits actually, then you might have a feature that has a high importance in this like variance based importance and one example there would be sharp importance um, but then the same feature would have a very low um, permutation feature importance if the model was overfitting using this feature but it can make sense to like look at both because sometimes you also want to over uh, interpret an overfitting model um, depending on the reason why you use interpretability okay okay that makes sense and so the permutation feature importance the idea is you shuffle one feature and then you see how the performance of the model changes compared to the original performance where you've got all the features and the idea is if it doesn't if the performance decreases a lot by shuffling a feature it means that this feature is important because it um, yes. helps the model to make good predictions right yeah i mean imagine you have one feature that the model didn't use at all it's a bit simplified case mm -hmm. but in this case if you shuffle a feature and feed the data again to your model uh, so think about like your model being a decision tree and it never used this feature for splitting mm -hmm. then obviously the the importance or the the performance doesn't change if you shuffle that one feature but the model model relies on this feature to mm -hmm. make correct predictions the more shuffling it her, um, shuffling the feature hurts the model performance now there's also problems with this approach uh, imagine if your features are highly correlated, mm -hmm. then by shuffling one of the features, you create new data points. That's how you can see it. And if you have a high correlation and yeah, most cases do, then this feature importance um, is computed based on maybe unrealis unrealistic data points. So imagine you have uh, for, uh, like people's uh, height and weight, and then you could have like a, if you take the uh, height of an adult and shuffle it. And then you have a toddler uh, in one row and it gets the height of the uh, adult and weight and height don't match anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's like an unrealistic data point. Your data, uh, model was never trained on and you used it for um, interpreting the model, which is yeah difficult, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so interpretability can also be a bit difficult. So mm -hmm. in this case, you would have to think about um, maybe shuffling the features together or using um, different ways of uh, or different methods for uh, the feature importance. And so why do you, or in your case, why do you look at feature importance? How does this help to improve your, your analysis or your projects? Yeah, so again, to have a concrete example, like the machine learning challenge I'm, I'm currently working on, it's about uh, forecasting um, like water supply and uh, uh, Western United States. And yeah, so I don't know much about hydrology. So kind of uh, just started working with the data without diving too much into the problem itself. 
And so I had also little domain knowledge. And just looking at the feature importance gave me like first ideas of uh, what were the most important features, uh, which sometimes was very um, obvious in hindsight. Mm -hmm. For example, one of the most important features is the snow coverage or the snow. Mm -hmm. It's called snow water equivalent. So how much um, at different like measurement station, how much um, like snow is there if you would like compute it as water and yeah i but at beforehand i didn't know like uh, what would be the most important features in hindsight it makes sense because if you read about it it's like ah oh, yeah that's the most important like it's it's not not a secret or anything but it was known to me but I, I learned it through the data through the feature importance that this this is yeah uh, mm -hmm. I, I kind of gained a little bit of domain knowledge through that i would say even yeah, I think it's also, yeah, it can even go beyond that um, in the sense that if you have a problem, um, I don't know, for example, let's say the num predicting the number of clothes you sell or whatever, and you try to train, you train a model for this, and then you see what's important, um, the importance of your feature. If you understand this and you're in the business, you can kind of feel okay, what if I need to take one or two actions, what are the actions that I need to take? Do I need to act on, I don't know, the size of my shops? Do I need to act on the number of employees in my shop? And so if you understand the features, you know kind of very quickly um, where you need to act. So even in terms of business, it can add, I think, quite quite a lot of value to have a global idea of what's what's important and what's not important. Yeah, I think that's a great example because often interpretability is, or no, often the machine learning model or the predictions itself or alone are not sufficient. Mm -hmm. So often when you, if you model something like uh, sales or churn prediction, it's nice to know and to predict this, but actually you want to change these numbers. So you might want to increase your sales, you might to prevent p um, customers from churning. So you want your models or your predictions to be also also actionable and one way to at least get an understanding of what the model relied upon for making these predictions you can use interpretability now to to use that knowledge you either need lots of domain or yeah you usually need lots of domain knowledge because mm -hmm. you can also make the wrong decisions mm -hmm. um, because the model obviously takes just associations and it's mm -hmm. not necessarily causal so you should also have an idea of causality for these uh, use cases and and know which fe features are causal and like about confounders and stuff um, but if you want to make it actionable you have to have a way to look inside the model to see which mm -hmm. factors it relied upon and so you could identify factors that you might be able to change mm -hmm. yeah no definitely yeah, that's why I think it's a great point. Like you, it's one thing to pre be able to predict things, um, but at some point you also want to change those predictions. Uh, as you mentioned, sales, you might want to increase those sales. And so if you want to do that, you need to look inside your model. So, so if we re re just a recap or a summary of what we've talked about. So interpretable machine learning, you either want to train a simple model like a regression, or you want to train a complex model if you want to train a complex model, there are two kinds of approaches, um, either model-specific approach, which work on particular models, or model-agnostic approach, which work on all models. And so those ones you, you like a lot because they work on, well, it doesn't matter which model you train, you, you use them after having trained your model. And so inside those model agnostic approach, we talked about global methods, which look at the entire uh, data set. So permutation feature importance or feature importance is one. And then there is also local methods, which look at specific instances of your data. Um, so do you want to talk about local versus global and maybe give a few examples of local methods that work well? Maybe one, one remark to, to the summarization. Uh, I think these are useful categories to think in, um, but it also shouldn't be like exclusive categories. It's not mm -hmm. either or. So you could, for example, use an interpretable model by design, mm -hmm. let's say decision tree or decision rules. Um, but you could still apply 
the these model agnostic methods because with a decision tree you mm-hmm. could m- maybe understand the decisions individually um but you still don't have an idea of like the feature effect like how does changing one of the features change the prediction you can't see it from just seeing the tree um so i think yeah it's useful to have these categories but you don't have to follow one or the other mm-hmm. approach you can also mix them now to the uh, local explanations uh, there's i think maybe the most uh the, the, like a lot of methods in this category mm-hmm. The idea of local explanations is that you want to explain a single prediction. So you have a complex model, it makes a prediction. Now, why did it make this prediction? Again, it's useful to differentiate the goal that you have in mind when when creating this explanation. Um, But in general, there are very different approaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are many approaches to how you can interpret a model locally. And the basic question is, when you have a prediction model, which can be very complex, and you have a prediction for one of your data points, how did this prediction come about? Mm-hmm. And there's now many, many different motivations how to explain this type of predi- or explain this prediction. One approach is Lime. I, th- I like to start with this one because it's the, I think, intuitive to understand, but uh, it's a bit, uh, it has a bit conceptual problems, I would say. Um, but here the idea is that you take the uh, interpretability by design approaches, so like a linear model, and try to fit it locally to your complex model. So you have this one data point, then you kind of sample data points around it and fit a linear regression curve through it and then use this as an explanation. So it's like a local surrogate model. The difficulty here is that it's difficult to to say what what local really means, like how how big should this neighborhood be? Um, a very different approach is sharp. So, sorry, just to to cut you on this one, uh, yeah. And then we can go into into sharp. How do you sample around your data point? So I get you get a data point, for example, sales uh, at a particular time during the day, with a few features, uh, whatever it can be, time of the day, number of sellers, price, whatever. How do you sample around this data point and fit a model? Do you create fake data points? Well, it's been a while since I wrote about Lime. I think it actually creates new data points. Mm-hmm. In theory, you could also use the data points you already have. Okay. And But the other, that's that's one part, this is the sampling. And mm-hmm. the other part is the weighting. So do you actually have a kernel that okay. gives you a weight around it, like the highest value mm-hmm. is of the kernels around the data point that you want to explain. And then the the weighting um, drops, it's like an exponentially weighted kernel. And that's and that's also the, the I think the conceptual difficulty mm-hmm. because you have to decide how like broad this kernel should be. And there's no good way to say how broad, like, like how you should scale this kernel. And, but, but this kernel decides what is your neighborhood mm-hmm. and how much how close a point has to be to be used for creating the explanation of your, for your prediction. Okay. Okay. So you create points that are kind of similar to the data points that you, the data point that you want to analyze, and then you fit a linear model with, you decide which features you want to include, or do you include um, the same features as the original model? How, how does this work, this model fitting? Yeah. So I think usually you would use the the features of your model Mm -hmm. i think in theory you can also use other features and it also makes sense to make it a sparse model because if you have hundreds of features then Mm -hmm. the explanation would be hundreds of features long Uh, but because that's one of the things that you usually want is some um, sparseness in your explanation and not all models give you that uh, not all methods give you that uh, but some can Mm -hmm. and and this is in line you can do this at you because you can basically swap out the uh, local models that you mm-hmm. use. It could also be a decision tree in theory, mm-hmm. but most times you see a linear regression model with like a sparse one. Okay, cool. And then, sorry, I cut you, but what about SHAP no then? Worries. SHAP uh, uses a very different idea. And the idea is that um, all the features are kind of players in a game and uh, they work together to achieve the prediction. Now the goal is to take this prediction or the value of the prediction and 
assign it fairly to the players. Um, so the, um, well, actually it's not a prediction, but the prediction minus the average prediction. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the explanation is uh, why did your prediction differ from the average prediction, like from your entire data set. And this difference is attributed to the individual features, your players. And the idea comes from, or the, the solution for this comes from game theory, because there's lots of uh, research about how you could, if you have a team and they collaborate and, and they get some prize, how do you fairly uh, attribute them to the players? How, how, how much payout does each of the players get? And one of these methods is called Chapley values. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, what Sharp does is to take this idea of Chapley values and apply it to machine learning predictions. Okay, and, and so it, and so it tries to allocate points or importance to the different features, and basically the features that have the most importance are the ones. Um, well, that's how the ones which have the highest Chaplet value are the ones that are the most important in some sense. Yeah, and that, that's a bit interesting because in the uh, for local explanation methods importance and effect of features kind of collapse because also the most negative feature is uh, mm -hmm. most negative sharp value also means that it impacted the prediction a lot and the sharp value itself can be like the value scale mm -hmm. can also be interpreted on as it's on the same level or in the same scale as the prediction itself so you can really kind of there's also these waterfall diagrams where you you kind of plot your average prediction like for your whole data set the prediction of your data point and the sharp value are like forces or, um, or flow of water that push the prediction either in one direction mm -hmm. or the other and um, explain it this way how this difference can be attributed. But you could also have that uh, features cancel each other out so that it first pushes in one direction and the other. Yeah, I, I think we should put the image from your book where you've got, for example, something that predicts cancer probability for a particular instance. And then you can see, basically for this instance, the prediction is high and you can kind of see why the prediction is high. Yeah. Um, there is, it's, a, it's very high because the person took um, a lot of, um, um, well, the person is, I don't know, old. And then also because mm -hmm. they took uh, lots of pills, for example. Um, so you can really see why the model predicted that the probability of cancer is high. Um, and same goes for if you've got another prediction that's low, you can also understand through Chaplet values why the prediction is slow. It could be one, because the person is young, uh, two, because mm -hmm. the person is very healthy. Um, I'm making it up, but um, you can really see for every prediction why the model or int an interpretation of why the model thinks this way, which is a really cool visualization, I think. Yeah, I think so too. It again has a bit these problems when features are highly correlated. It's it's kind of a theme mm -hmm. in interpretability, uh, maybe even a philosophical problem because if you have strongly correlated features, how can you even attribute one it like uh, mm -hmm. reasons to one or the other feature? Mm -hmm. uh, so this is always a problem with these methods. So yeah, but again, solutions to this um, to for example compute Chapley values together for features, so they just get one Chapley value. Uh, if you combine them um, as one player. Uh, so there are solutions to this, but yeah, this is always something you should keep in mind um, yeah, when you interpret the model. Yeah, the, another good thing about Shapley values is, or Shap, that you can, in, in the beginning I mentioned that there's Shap importance. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of stack them and recombine them to get global interpretations of your model. Uh, so things like Shap importance, which is a, also ranks your features and it's kind of this, you can see them as a variance based, um, or at least it's only based on a prediction, not the performance. And there's also sharp um, feature effects that tell you, or sharp dependence plots that tell you how changing uh, or how for different values of your feature, the sharp values change and they give you an impression of how the feature affects the predictions. Okay, so it's, you can use SHAP for both global and local interpretability techniques, basically. Yeah, exactly. So that's also a selling point of SHAP, I would say. Uh, I would advise always to look at different interpretation methods and always keep in mind, like, what's your goal uh, with the interpretation? 
But if, for example, your goal is to do some debugging of your model, then Shop is always like a good starting point as well because it gives you lots of insights and not just you can look at into individual predictions, mm -hmm. but you can also combine this to to the importance plots, and so you get like a a lot of different angles on your on your model. Okay, great. So so looking a bit, taking a step back and looking at interpretability in general. Yeah, what's your advice for people who want to start? They they've got a project and they want to start using some interpretable techniques. What's what's your general advice on this? Yeah, just get started. So um, I would, there's lots of libraries already out there, and things like permutation feature importance can uh, can be implemented by yourself even. And yeah, so you can you can make mistakes with this, of course, and and if your features correlate, it's problematic and so on. Um, but what you can always get started with is like use it for debugging and improving your model. So that's something where you just use it for yourself. You don't have to show it to anyone yet. Uh, you can just get a feeling for how these methods work. So I th I would just start using them for your, when you develop a model. And so you could get to know the different methods to play around with them, get a feeling for what they do and without uh, getting into the, like the deep end and the difficulties. So just an easy way to get started. Start easy and then and then you can use more complex thing or you can use them to drive business decisions once you yeah fail. exactly if yeah then there's more stakes involved or if you communicate if you use them to communicate it to other people then there's already it's more difficult because then you have to be sure that you and yourself understand the methods correctly and that they really do what you think they do and then you have to to teach other people to use these methods or to mm -hmm. interpret them. So that's uh, it's already a, a level high in the complexity. And one good way to get started is also to read your book. Um, I well, yes. I'm making promotion, but I really I read it, and that's how I actually reach out to you because I think it's really a a great book, like very well explained. You have the maths, but it's not like full yes. maths. You understand the the intuition as well, so it's really beginner level friendly. Um, if you if you understand some maths, um, well, you can get the maths and go a bit into the details, but you can also just get the intuition if you want, which is why I think it's it's quite a good good thing. Um, and it's available online for free. Oh, exactly. Yeah, I I actually bought it as well because I like to have the <laughs> to have the book. Um, one last question on interpretability, and then we can talk about your other book, Modeling Mindset. My question is. You talked about libraries. What are the libraries that people can use to use interpretable methods? I know there is SHAP, for example, for, for Shapley values. Um, any other yeah. libraries that you recommend? So if you use R, uh, I implemented the IML package. Um, not putting too much time into uh, like developing it further at the moment, but it's quite stable. And there's also Daleks, um, which is also an R package. And they have like also lo lots of um, things implemented there from global to local. Um, Scikit-learn, I think, has now, like, uh, I think feature importance implemented. And uh, for model-specific versions, like for Random Forest, I also implemented, I think. Um, yeah, then there's a sharp and a line uh, packages, both in R and in Python. Yeah, so yeah, lots lots of packages to play with. Okay, great, perfect. Well, let's close the interpretable ML chapter then and talk a bit about the other book you wrote, Modeling Mindset. Can you first explain what's Modeling Mindset? Why did you write this book and what is it about? Yeah, as I mentioned, I started out as a statistician and later on discovered machine learning for myself, but also had this like insight for myself that it's it's quite it's somehow similar, but also very different. So when I participated in my first Kaggle challenge, I was like, I know how to make predictions with a model. I know linear regression, generalized additive models. So I thought, and I already used this for in statistical consulting. So I had a bit of experience. So I thought, okay, it should definitely work out on uh, on this competition. And I, yeah, it was really bad. <laughs> um, and then I realized, okay, um, this is, I need a different approach. It's it's a different way of thinking about the problem. It's not about thinking, 
okay, uh, from from this data generating process, like what's the the distribution of the target and which variables should I use? But you should more think about, okay, this is performance based. I just have to have a good performance and it should be like generalization error should be uh, small. So I have to think about validation setups. And another thing that inspired me to, to write this book was the, the paper by Leo Breiman, uh, Two Cultures of St um, Statistical um, Modeling, where he also describes, he was like, I, I think, yeah, in academia, uh, doing statistics, went shot out into industry and took a more machine learning approach, also invented random forests and so on. And then wrote about this, like, that there's these two modeling mindsets, one more performance driven, the other more like this about the data generating process. And I kind of took this idea and wrote, wrote about these mindsets. So one distinguishing element is like the statistics versus mm -hmm. machine learning, where you have this great overlap in methods, but very different way of approaching a problem. But I also went into details explaining, for example, difference between frequentist and Bayesian statistics uh, or the different flavors of machine learning, like supervised, unsupervised reinforcement learning, because I also think that there are mindset differences. So you have maybe overlap in methods, but you approach problems very differently when you come from these different um, approaches. And is there other problems that can only be solved with statistical mindsets and others which can only be solved with machine learning mindsets? Or is it more like two different ways of thinking, but both can be used to solve problems? Yeah, some problems I think can be solved by different mindsets, um, but some problems at least, or at least how you evaluate how well mm -hmm. you solve the problem. So of course, two people can model um, the same target, but if you formulate it as, okay, this is a competition and we only judge your solution based on the performance on a private leaderboard. So like Kaggle mm -hmm. or other machine learning competitions. Yes, you can do this with like your statistical approach. Uh, we think about target distribution and so on, um, but it won't be the best approach. Um, but if, the solution is judged based on, okay, um, maybe we need something like a hypothesis test or want to make a decision whether there's like a statistical significance, then yeah, you can train still a machine learning model, but you won't get this out of it. Um, so yeah, and some models or some, some problems can't be solved with one mindset, I would say, or not sufficiently at least. So I don't know. Yeah, you could, or if you do a class analysis or unsupervised learning, it might help you with, I don't know, sales forecasting, mm -hmm. but there's no guarantee. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And so what's the main difference for you? Or what are the main differences and things that maybe also commonalities between stats mindsets and machine learning mindsets? So let's start with the commonalities. Uh, it's about if, so I, I, studied statistics so i knew a lot of the math behind also the machine learning already so mm -hmm. obviously logistic regression linear regression these are also algorithms or models used in in machine learning mm -hmm. and sometimes you would see online arguments between us ah, logistic regression machine learning or statistics but i think that's the wrong question or the wrong thing to argue over mm -hmm. uh, the question is only how you use it and for me, that, that's that's also the big different uh, difference. And that's why I call it the mindsets, because it's not necessarily only the methods that you use, but it's how you use them and how you motivate them. So you might have a situation where two people end up with the same linear regression model, or even more people, um, but they had different motivations to do so. So the, the statistician might be motivated by thinking about which variables to include based on domain knowledge and um, thinking about, okay, the target might be a um, Gaussian distribution, like conditional and the variables and so on, and then arrive at this linear regression model. And the, the machine learning person might have compared like 10 different models and the linear regression model just ended up being the best one. So both had the same model in the end, but they have very different motivations. And I'd argue that they are also allowed to do different things with it only. So because they came out of different processes, um, 
So the machine learning, for example, can say something about how he or she expects uh, the model to perform with uh, new data. Mm -hmm. um, but a statistician can then say things about it, like do statist statistical inference and say, okay, assuming that it represents my data generating process well, I can now interpret the, the coefficients and uh, the significance levels and so on. Okay, and so your book is kind of a view on all those different ways of thinking because there is stats and machine learning, but as you mentioned, there is within machine learning, there is supervised, unsupervised. Within stats, there is a frequentist and Bayesian. Um, yeah. And so you dive into all those things. Yeah, so the my motivation was to write this book was also that you find because you find a lot of material on this, right? Like machine learning versus statistics, frequent test versus Bayesian. But very often when you learn about these things, it's very math driven, very like, so for me, becoming aware of these things, I kind of had to write this book to mm -hmm. become aware of these differences myself, because you need this high level view, I think, to, to really understand the differences or otherwise it just takes a very, very long time to really get like to know that the differences in these like big assumptions that you make when you either do like frequent statistics or unsupervised learning. So these can be very different. Okay. And so, so you wrote interpretable machine learning, modeling mindset. Is there a third or other books that you wrote or that you plan to, to write? Somewhere? I have four books at the moment. Okay. So then I wrote also interpreting machine learning models with shop, which mm -hmm. basically is a deep dive into interpretable machine learning, but only with shop and also with code examples. Then I also wrote an uh, introduction to conformal prediction and conformal prediction is a method for quantifying uncertainty of um, predictions. Uh, yeah, so this is also a very short book and was kind of uh, based on, um, I didn't know much about conf conformal prediction before, so it was a way for me also to learn. So yeah, four books at the moment and also writing another book, uh, which is about supervised machine learning and science. Uh, this first book also write together with a co-author, uh, Timo Freisleben. It's, he's a, a former colleague of mine. And the book is about how supervised machine learning can be used when you do research and thinking it's a bit philosophical, but also putting like these puzzle pieces together. One of them, of course, interpretability um, and these puzzle pieces, which are needed to make supervised machine learning actually useful in science because there's yeah more special, more specific uh, needs uh, that need to be addressed when you want to use machine learning for yeah for for research. One thing I like is all those books are very original. Like you don't see you don't see many others or even any others out there. Is that how you decide which book you're you're gonna write? You try to find original topics or mm, yeah, I don't know. I I think it's one of my flaws and maybe but also. A uh, good thing that I usually write about things that I myself am just learning or just mm -hmm. want to learn about. Maybe the exception is interpreting machine learning models with Sharp because I already had a lot of material on this. But the other books were always also driven by my desire to learn something new. And uh, yeah, I think flaw in that sense that it's maybe not the cleverest way if you, because I'm now full time author and have to live from this. Um, so this obviously takes a bit more effort to, to write books when you learn the stuff yourself. Um, but yeah, but I, on the other hand, it's why I, I chose this path because I want to learn uh, new things. And um, But sometimes I feel like only when I just learned it that there's value in it, mm -hmm. which doesn't make any sense because something I read, already know is super, might be super valuable to someone else. Um, but yeah, I, I enjoy like this learning plus writing combination. Okay, great. Well, looking forward to your new books then. Maybe one last question. Uh, yeah. If you had one advice for people to progress in their career, what would it be? Just just one advice. Maybe it's like anti-advice, uh, but I'm a big fan or of sometimes ignoring advice from others. <laughs> so... Um, throughout my career, I've often been like ignoring advice and I think it was often good because sometimes you just know what you want to do and, but everyone tells you otherwise. And, but sometimes it's good to be stubborn. For me, it was writing the book, uh, where sometimes people told me not to do it. 
Um, but yeah, it's very difficult because advice can also be good. And if you are very stubborn, you will also, yeah, won't be good as well. So yeah, but sometimes it's okay to ignore advice from others. Okay, great. Well, thanks a lot, Christoph. It was great to chat with you and get to learn from you. Have a great day and hope to catch up very soon. Thanks, thanks for having me, Neil. Thank you.